So I would like to uh, start my presentation by saying, and I believe I express this sentiment on behalf of our entire group that we miss today John Wagner, who unfortunately was not able to join us today, but I would like to give him a full credit for the idea behind of these experiments support and bringing us all together to share this quite interesting and somewhat challenging data with this um, audience. So today we are talking about remote cardiac monitoring. Yes, this is monitoring and if I'm using Chris's lab tax classification, it's um, the old concept because we know how to do cardiac safety monitoring in clinical trials with a new measure, which is continuous monitoring, exceeding substantially a conventional uh, continuous monitoring such as um, Holter. So we are following here the standard um, flow as um, Joe explained earlier to us. We will start with a problem statement, statement of need, and we will explain to you what these studies were and what we find. Um, context of use is, of course, important, and we will show what actually fits in the evidentiary framework and what doesn't, and what we are proposed for this cardiac type of monitoring to bring forward if um, the stakeholders who are interested in this experiment find it useful. And we will have uh, the Q&A uh, panel um, and my colleagues are going to join me for, uh, for the Q&A. Um, I would like to start with a disclaimer similar to the one that Empower Group did. It's very easy to be smart on a high-end side and say, we should have done this, we should have done this. Please remember that these studies started in early 2016. We didn't have mobile technology CTTI recommendations. The biomarker qualification um, evidentiary framework by the FDA was not there. And we were discovering uh, this stuff as we were moving along and figuring out what makes sense to do. Please bear in mind when we uh, present our data. I will start here with a summary of the evidentiary framework and uh, what we try to do is to take certain elements of safety um, profile normally done in clinical trials such as heart rate or respiratory rate and see if it can be built into continuous monitoring in clinical trials with the idea that eventually these measures can be done remotely instead of keeping the subjects in the clinical pharmacology unit. To understand how uh, the data, safety data shapes up in the real world um, setting, and probably help with an early signal detection instead of discovering it in a phase three when enormous resources have already been invested in the drug development. The context of use is vital signs such as heart rate and respiratory rate evaluated in normal healthy volunteers. This is an important distinction for our use case. And the benefits of continuous monitoring are clear that this is dense continuous data dense continuous data for dose adjustments, um, drug discontinuation if we see some concerning uh, signals, and in some cases it could be a good pharmacodynamic markers. Um, there are some risks. The biggest risks that we uh, uh, identified are, of course, false and uh, false negatives and false positives, either missing the signal or having too many episodes which are not real. Um, and uh, what is important to highlight here that 
if we are considering uh, 510K clear devices or 510K exempt that has uh, some um, regulatory uh, status, that the context uh, of use might be different than indications of use or uh, intended use of the device. Please bear this in mind because it will come during the presentations. And what we realized at the end of the day that we completely need to rework what we def define normal ranges, normal inter uh, interval, and definitely we need more uh, approaches with data um, analytics and statistics. So the problem statement. Um, the, early goal, the goal of early clinical trials is to establish a pharmacokinetics, pharmacodynamics, and safety profile of an investigational drug. Usually, the data collection uh, done when the study subjects are confined to the clinical pharmacology unit, and there are follow-up visits or phone calls after the subjects leave the unit. The duration of the confinement varies uh, from one to several weeks, depending on the properties of the investigational compound and anticipated or emerging safety profile. Normally, safety data collection done at predefined time points, whether it's laboratory tests or it's a vital sign data collection. The uh, confinement for extended periods of time, sometimes it could be weeks, is extremely inconvenient for the study subjects, and it's somewhat artificial settings that doesn't provide uh, the data about normal person's activity. Once the subject leaves the unit, there is very little uh, or no safety information other than the subject's recall, and if people come back and they have abnormal ECG or the lab test, it's very difficult to establish what happened in, in between to interpret this data. How, how this is needed in um, drug development? Uh, certain elements can be uh, collected continuously and comprehensively in early stage clinical trial using wearable devices to collect uh, continuous data, whether in CPU or after the discharge from the CPU. And it will provide uh, the data that is collected so-called in the wild. Early detection of a signal sa uh, safety signal can inform dose adjustment or discontinuation of a drug candidate with saf safety liabilities. What, why we propose to um, take this path with digital measures versus uh, current modalities? It's not clear what is happening in between uh, safety data collection and the safety signal can be missed. I will show you the data how it can happen in the model system. And it's not clear how the safety profile uh, may be impacted by activities of daily living exercise whilst uh, subjects leave the unit. Um, in order to help you to understand, I'm going to use the same uh, data flow diagram um, to show you how the cardiac data is being collected. It's done on the subject, and I'm wearing one of the devices. It's the next generation um, model device from one of the devices described in the study. And in the minute, we are gonna go into a live um, demonstration. The raw data is being collected to the device, but then there is a step of data processing and it can happen on the cloud or on the phone. In this specific case, it happens on the phone that streams the data from the cardiac monitor that I'm wearing. Then there is data processing, and again, it can happen in um, different steps. And from the phone, the data is being streamed uh, to the cloud where the data is being analyzed by applying certain algorithm, it comes to the interpretation and merging with other relevant data. 
What I'm going to do now, I will show you my data that has been collected through this device, and I'm going to ask uh, a member of our team, Dan, to help the interpretation. Dan is a cardiologist, so he will provide us a professional opinion. Can you please switch the monitor? So this is uh, my resting heart, um, resting a heart rate from um, the data collected um, this early morning, and I will ask Dan to say a few words about what he is seeing here on the screen. Death is imminent, but uh, otherwise. <clears throat> so this is a normal ECG waveform, uh, and for those of you who aren't um, used to looking at ECGs, you can see a number of bumps. There's a small bump that's called the P wave, which is uh, a sign of atrial contraction. There's the next uh, complex called the QRS complex, which is the ventricles contracting. And then there's a T wave, which is uh, a sign of the ventricles uh, repolarizing or, or relaxing. So those are the components of a normal ECG um, signal. And so you see across the entire frame that the ry rhythm is normal, same uh, pattern on each beat, and the rate is pretty regular across the different the different beats. So that's kind of how we, we would look at look at this this strip. And the difference of this particular device uh, compared to um, Holter ECG that used for ambulatory monitoring that it has a built-in accelerometer, and I'm showing my um, data from this night. You can see that. It's pretty flat. I was sleeping and the activity counts are low. Physiologically, it makes sense. This morning, um, I made an, an experiment and I went to the gym. <laughs> Why else I would go to the gym to do, <laughs> to do an experiment? And as I was on the elliptical machine, my heart rate was of 142 and I will ask Dan to comment. <laughs> so, so you can see again the same pattern of a small P wave followed by a QRS followed by a T wave. That's normal. The pattern is normal across the entire <laughs> entire strip and the rate's regular. But one thing to note is she's exercised during this. So it's pretty impressive. It's a very clear waveform despite the fact that, that she's exercising. Um, and that's one of the strengths of a device like this. You can get a very robust signal. And let's look at um, my um, accelerometer rate. You can see it's more variable and the counts are higher. Um, this is for, we are not trying to promote here any specific device, but this is for demonstration purposes that should help you to understand uh, later some of the issues and data of data interpretation that we are gonna be taking, talking later in the presentation. Can you please switch to the presentation? Thank you. So let's get into the study specifics. This were two small um, studies where we had um, two devices. One of them uh, was an ECG single, uh, single lead ECG patch similar to the one I'm uh, wearing. Right now, the study was done in normal healthy volunteers, typical phase one uh, population, and um, one of them was a health patch by Vital Connect, and the other one was Body Guardian by Preventus. The health patch uh, collected HR, respiratory rate and skin temperature, Body Guardian collected only heart rate and respiratory rate. We also had a wrist-worn accelerometer because we wanted to get additional data of sleep. Um, the first study, the data was collected during subject confinement in the uh, pharmacology unit, and in the second study, it was both pharmacology unit confinement and uh, subjects took these devices home. Both devices were cleared under 510K. We had access to the raw data. I will show you why it was important. The algorithms for data processing and analysis were proprietary. And this specific device that I just showed you, um, 
had ability to, we, uh, th there was an opportunity to see data in the near real time, so we did not deploy this modality in the actual study. It was an exploratory endpoint, and we stipulated in the protocol that the data will be kept in the safe harbor because we didn't know how the devices would perform and will not be used for any clinical decision making. And we compare it to matching conventional uh, outcomes. Few things we learned here that it is possible to conduct such experiments. We were not, uh, um, we didn't know of any previous uh, precedents. Um, when comparison to the gold standard, we run into some of this problem that um, Dan Carlin highlighted previously because the uh, comparator sh uh, should be uh, chosen uh, carefully. It was an optional informed consent form and um, all device administration was done by the uh, site uh, personnel. The interesting finding that came very soon that um, subjects uh, expressed, uh, how do I say it? made a comment that if they are to do additional study procedures, they expect compensation. Please remember that normal healthy volunteers population participating in phase one studies is usually different than patient population, those who have disease conditions, so perceptions uh, might be um, different. And we got the feedback from the site that they really needed hands-on training to understand technology before they can successfully deploy it. Overall, uh, both sites and subjects ex expressed at the end of the study high satisfaction with um, the technologies. We completed all the analysis at the end of the study, did analytical evaluation uh, by comparing to the corresponding conventional uh, measures and assessing phase validity of the data. As Dan already pointed out, um, ambulatory ECG data can be noisy and it needs to be approached carefully. Um, and data analytics and statistical approaches are really important. What was the context of use? In the context of use, we foresaw two different scenarios. Probably in 99, 95% of cases, this will be a retrospective safety analysis, the way how it's conventionally done for the clinical trial. However, in some rare cases when there is emerging safety signal and the data needs to be available ASAP, it may be uh, ad hoc analysis. I've been in clinical studies when the unexpected uh, safety signal emerged, not predicted by uh, non-clinical data, and I remember very well how important it was to get access to emerging study data as quickly as possible. Analytical validation, what device is meant to measure, and human factor testing are really important. And I would like to emphasize whatever we discovered in these studies apply only to normal healthy volunteer population. If we are considering any disease population, these experiments needs to be redone and the context of use will change. So how all these measures are related to conventional measurements? Um, there are, are different versions of uh, multiple lead ECGs um, and including 12 lead ECGs. The protocol uh, of collecting these data is usually um, resting and supine for at least a few minutes. Holter monitoring that also can be done with various number of leads. Um, it's an ambulatory counterpart. The respiratory rate is usually measured manually and the body temperature is um, measured in the oral um, cavity. What is the relationship of the remote measures to the clinical outcome? The reference ranges, what is normal, what is abnormal, um, are well established. This uh, range of 60 to 100 uh, 
bits per minute uh, reference uh, interval is so well established that when we were looking for the original reference, how it was established, we couldn't find it. We looked for the textbook. If anyone knows how this <laughs> reference range was established, please let me know. I'm very curious to learn. The other thing that we realized immediately that not all features of conventional um, ECG monitoring are available from um, single lead ECG, such as QT or PR prolongation requires um, <coughs> uh, preferably 12 lead ECG. Variables are very well established. We know what is a heart rate, we know what is respiratory rate. What doesn't fit um, is the resting and supine protocol. When people are moving, the heart rate, respiratory rate changes and there is no clear guidance. We couldn't find anything that will sell our equivalent. If people are moving around, this is your equivalent of 60 to 100 uh, bits per minute. I made a demonstration for the purposes showing you how it's important to have the data of physical activity because physical activity will impact uh, these measures. And another thing that we very quickly discovered that it's very difficult to interpret skin temperature because it's much more variable than the one measured, the body temperature measured in the oral cavity. It's impacted by where it's being measured, by closing, by ambient temperature and physical activity. And when we compared the oral uh, cavity body temperature to skin temperature, we couldn't find any correlation at all. The benefit assessment. If we um, qualify these vital sign measurements um, and wrist-worn actigraphy devices, again, there is substantial benefits to um, conducting early uh, clinical trials, um, potential early signal detection, <laughs> dose adjustments, early discontinuation, and a more reliable assessment um, of pharmacodynamic measures if for instance, this is um, heart rate. It's going to be used predominantly in phase one clinical trials, but it can be used in any phase. And what is a benefit to a particular individual or society? It's more effective drug development. It's easier participation in clinical trials and more feedback on how people are doing as a part of this clinical trial. The risk assessment. The risk assessment is always longer than benefit because we are so good at finding things uh, that um, need to be worked on or are a concern. As I said, false positives and false uh, negatives are a concern. False negative, it means uh, the uh, potential uh, safety signal can be missed and it's closely related to the missing data problem. False positive. I showed you my uh, tracer ECG. If there is a suspected cardiac event, it means that the um, clinician who does the safety monitoring in a clinical trial has to go and verify that it's indeed true versus the tracer the way how I showed you. If there are too many episodes, it's a lot of work and unnecessary distraction from the study procedures. Analytical validity is really important and the access to the raw data is key because it requires for both uh, device validation and also potential signal uh, verification. And again, the uh, reference ranges and intervals are needed for ambulatory conditions. <laughs> Regulatory. The context of use for a specific clinical study may be different than the indications of use and the intended use on, uh, stipulated on the 510K clearance if a clear device is being used in the study. And even if we have clear devices, it means that validation still needs to be performed according to the context of use. <coughs> 
data analysis, correlation and limits of agreement, a standard statistical approach of comparing two different measurement uh, methods, represent a challenge because now we have a continuous data and we are comparing to um, data collected at um, predefined time points or halter monitoring uh, that has um, li somewhat limited um, because it's not very convenient for the subject and the regular duration is somewhere between 24 and 48 hours. And data filtering, what is um, real signal and what is noise becomes important. I already touched um, on the fact that access to the raw data is essential and it served as two purposes. First, to verify that uh, the um, concept that we are measuring is captured accurately and also for the verification if there is a signal, um, a, a safety signal. And uh, prior human factor testing is required because if device is not convenient, if it's difficult to manage by the study subjects, there will be uh, missing uh, data and interpretation of the ambulatory data is far more challenging than uh, resting and supine protocol. For data analysis, uh, there is a need for data review and reporting and um, novel analytical approaches that would include uh, filtering out noise and define acceptable false positive and false negative rate to find the right balance. Now I'm going to go into the state evidence and actual um, study data. These graphs show the correlation analysis for heart rate and um, respiratory rate and also the um, limits of agreement. When we compared heart rate, that was comparison device to device, uh, the correlation was almost perfect. It's, it's, it's amazing how well it was because in clinical settings, uh, I rarely see R of uh, 0.99, but this is indeed um, the case. When we looked for the respiratory uh, rate, there was very weak correlation, and this is a comparison of the manual and the device method. And the way how device collects the data and how the human being that looks at the person's chest uh, rising and falling is very different. Um, I don't want to comment that one of the methods is wrong, but manual to device data collection is a challenge. I've seen it in my previous life in the lab method when you compare the hemocytometer cell count and automated cell counts, they never match. That's exactly what we are seeing here. The other thing that the limits of agreement uh, for uh, Heart rate is very tight. Again, device to device to, uh, comparison, the limits of agreement for respiratory rate are very broad. So it's hard to make um, conclusion when um, comparing different methods. And this morning we've heard a similar challenge um, comparing to some of the clinical scales. So with comparison to conventional methods, we used maybe 2% of the data to be compared. We need to make sense from the rest of it. And what we did here, we estimated the face validity data at the aggregate, panel, uh, at the aggregate level. And we looked for diurnal variation in heart rate, respiratory rate, skin temperature, and physical activity. And all this physiological data made sense. It was consistent with what published uh, with the data that the uh, skin temperature was the highest at night when people are sleep sleeping under covers. The heart rate is the lowest and goes up when people start moving and the same about the respiratory rate. 
When I showed these data to my pharmacovigilance clinicians, they said, okay, this is all nice, but it doesn't help me in my day job because I'm reviewing the safety data at the patient level. You need to show me the patient level data. And we went. So what we did, we selected a handful of um, heart rates similar to how I showed you. And we looked how well the um, reported data by device matches the ECG tracer. And it was actually pretty accurate for the body guardian device. We also looked how much data we missed. And we called it gaps. Not missingness, but gaps. We did two calculations. One of them is how many time periods longer than one minute were there when we had no data and what the overall uh, sum of these gaps. And the reasons for of missing data are multifold. People not wearing devices, some issue with device connectivity, and also data being filtered out is invalid by the device algorithm. First and third issue of not wearing the data and data being filtered out is invalid were predominant. We also were trying to make sense of the overall massive data that we collected. And we call it here approach to analytical validation because we cannot call it formally analytical validation. In order to design a validation experiment, one needs to set up an acceptance criteria. This was our pilot experiment, and until we had the data, we couldn't set up the acceptance criteria. But what we did here, we established brackets of different heart rates and see how many measurements will fall into these brackets to understand how much work it would be to see what is below the normal range, what is above normal range, and what is non-physiological range that potentially can be artifact or, or requires a safety follow-up. With this specific device, um, it was very reasonable. We had only a few episodes um, of heart rate above um, uh, 150, and in this specific study, we had a positive control, which was amphetamine challenge, which was supposed to increase the heart rate, and it can be physiologically explained. With the other device, the picture was a little bit more difficult. We also had missing data calculated the same way. We had a large number of episodes with heart, a heart rate above 150, or about above 180 in normal healthy volunteers in a clinical and pharmacology unit. We didn't follow through every single of them. We did as much as we could, but a lot of them were noise. And here I am showing the examples of the ECG tracers where the, the heart rate below normal consistent with the ACG traces within normal is consistent, but highly ele elevated heart rate seems to be noise. What does it mean, again, for the safety monitoring clinician that they have to go through every single of them if it was not a safe harbor but a real study and sh disprove that this is not an episode of tachycardia, which can be a lot of work. And the last piece of evidence that I want to share with you is from the study um, <clears throat> where we had an amphetamine challenge. The amphetamine challenge was done because it was relevant to the drug mechanism of action, but for our purposes it served as a perfect positive control because amphetamine is known to elevate heart rate. And it was done in the presence of drug and in the absence of drug, so we had a perfect control. As a part of the study procedures, uh, there was a CT scan lasting for one hour that provided another perfect control because subjects were immobile. It was one hour resting and supplying very firm data. And what you are seeing in this graph 
In the bottom panel is a heart rate. The gray dots indicate continuous heart rate monitoring from the wearable device, and red dots show uh, the uh, conventional uh, safety data collection at predefined time points. The dots, red and gray dots, are almost superimposed during the safety collection procedures, but as, as soon as people get up and start moving, the upper panel is the accelerometer data, the heart rate goes up to 150. If we were looking only at the red dots, we would say the heart rate didn't change a lot. There was no heart elevation, but if you look at the device data, there was substantial heart rate. This is not a real safety signal, it's a model, and we were expecting to have heart rate elevation from amphetamine challenge, but this model shows what can happen in a real life and how the safety signal can be missed. So now I shared with you the evidence of what we have done in these experiments, and I would like to pass the microphone to Vadim Zipunikov from uh, John Hopkins University, who unfortunately was not able to join us today, but he's on the phone and he will speak about data considerations. Great, thank you. Uh, just to confirm, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, we can hear you. Hello? Oh, great. All right, so I included a few uh, general data and statistical considerations. Um, and I'm getting a feedback noise, so it's a little bit hard to speak, but uh, let, me, let me try to fix it real quick. Just checking again, uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Yes, we can hear you. Great. Uh, I'm sorry, I was getting some um, feedback noise. So, so I think the, the major advantage of ambulatory monitoring is that um, you can follow and observe subjects for the 22 hours, but this is also a yeah. Because uh, as we saw in some of the examples Elena showed, you know, the subject, it's really hard to, you know, expect the subject is not going to be moving during 22 hours. Uh, although that would be perfect for the algorithm. And uh, one of the major challenges is the movement artifact. So the movement, so when the movement happens, separating movement signal and the target is uh, still uh, one of the challenges uh, So you should expect um, from the beginning when you start working going here and you will you should be ready to do this. Uh, and this is why it's still important uh, it's still important to remember you know when you interpret this output when you choose a specific type of the study that they result on the choice of the device uh, because uh, data processing now that um proprietary so we need to uh, you know, first of all, know how well they work, how uh, validated they are, and uh, and still condition your results on, on those. And uh, this is why it's really important when you choose the device, uh, look into validation literature in the published evidence by manufacturer or, you know, in previous studies using these devices and trying to come up with some independent validation. And uh, as Helena mentioned, it's uh, extremely important to have access to the raw data, which is not necessarily the case for all devices. Uh, and as we saw, it might be really um, useful to, you know, being able to access the raw data to do retrospective, um, to retrospectively review the data and possibly detect that device or sensor has some episodic malfunction, which sometimes happens. Uh, you could also identify that the signal was approaching a calibration range, and once it's close to the calibration limit, the, uh, the signal might be less reliable. And this is why the derived values of heart rate and respiratory 
uh, less, less, reliable, less reliable uh, once you're at the boundaries of the calibration range, and you could figure this out by looking at the raw data. And finally, me, uh, dealing with the missing data, you know, uh, great if you have just a few, you know, data points, just a few seconds of missingness, but quite often you might have a long stretches of the missingness, and uh, the question is how much you would allow, um, you know, uh, in your study uh, in terms of is this uh, valid contribution from the subject from a specific period of observation and et cetera. So uh, dealing with recent data, it's, uh, it's, it's, uh, you have to think through how you will be uh, you know, handling this. And also understanding the, cost, the context of, of the event. Um, as Elena showed, you know, um, uh, collecting this context might be not necessarily trivial. So, for example, some devices provide you the way to, uh, for the patient or for participant to report, you know, uh, cardiac feeling. So, for example, if you uh, feel some uh, you know, flutter or atrial fibrillation, you might report this by pressing the event button, or you could uh, actually use some uh, some sort of online interfaces where you have a scroll down menu and you choose a, from the inventory of uh, possible events. And you could also report some other contextual information in terms of sort of, some sort of um, electronic diaries which might be useful for putting the signal in the context. Uh, and uh, this is what you could say as a patient reported uh, context. Also, there is a, these days you can uh, uh, develop algorithm-derived uh, context and one example is uh, built-in accelerometers are used for um, movement artifact removal. Uh, and uh, But you could also uh, identify posture, and also you could uh, identify, or you could estimate and, and try to guess whether the person is sleeping or not by putting together uh, data, the signal coming from the accelerometer as well as the, from the heart rate, for example, heart rate variability. So, uh, you know, Observing events during sleep and observing events during wake might be um, different types of events depending on the questions you have. And finally, a clinician derived context, as, as we saw, you know, just by looking retrospectively at the signal and seeing some cardiac events, you might actually uh, um, think in terms of what was happening with the heart rate before. Did you observe some gradual increase and whether it's a real event or is it, uh, you know, just artifact, as Elena said. Um, can we go to the next slide? So for, uh, for statistical consideration, I think um, there are uh, a few advantages of using um, big advantages of using ambulatory cardiac patches, and I think one of them, one of the major ones, is establishing patient level normative. So as Elena said, you know, you might be struggle, you know, finding and uh, finding validation. And evidence literature on the specific population level norms, which might be, you know, stratified by age, gender, or specific clinical group. But that right now, what you can do, you can actually estimate subject-specific or patient-specific norm by doing a pretreatment monitoring for, say, you know, a couple of days or seven days, and then when specific treatment is introduced, you might actually. Uh, you will be using probably this uh, patient-specific norm, which is much more, uh, much more efficient way to proceed. And I think another advantage, big advantage of using ambulatory uh, cardiac patches is, uh, in addition, you know, just to have a uh, more reliable estimation of the cardiac burden. So, for example, you know, you wear the device for seven days or for 14 days, and then you quantify the total burden in terms of frequency of the event, duration of those events, severity, and sometimes timing, uh, you could actually use and employ novel statistical approaches which allow you to go beyond this uh, kind of a true totals and uh, which potentially might uh, lead you to the maximization of the uh, power for detection of the signal. And the signal could be, you know, treatment signal, efficiency signal, et cetera. Or you could detect that there is a divergence from the, from the pretreatment norm, right? Uh, and this divergence might be not necessarily in terms of the duration, but might be more nuanced. It might happen during specific timings, 
you target, you know, some circadian components of the uh, of the drug intake. And finally, you know, the really important consideration is that you could speed up identification of possible false positive uh, cardiac events, and uh, and you could identify those periods and maybe you know involve a clinician who will manually review and the uh, you know this machine learning plus the clinician experiment actually might help you a lot uh, to speed up the whole process. And uh, you know. People these days use uh, kind of novel statistical approaches, functional data analysis for uh, modeling circadian uh, changes and circadian patterns of the cardiac uh, signal, circadian rhythmicity. Also use uh, state transition models and uh, multi-resolution analysis. I think uh, depending on the question and depending on the type of features which might be relevant to this question, you might employ some of these techniques or some other techniques. And of course, the same method can be used both for you know safety, which we're focusing on this talk, but also for estimation efficacy, efficacy and the treatment effect. Uh, and finally, you know, like the studies which uh, currently report some results, typically those studies is relatively small. Now the sample sizes goes up, but it's really important still to have this independent validation in external data set and the external studies using the same device or using uh, devices with the similar COU or similar goal. So I will conclude here. Thank you, Vadim. And I would like to conclude this presentation with um, lesson learned. Um, what we learned that 510K clears does not uh, render necessarily device to be fit for purpose for use in clinical trials. More framework uh, is needed to assess analytical validity and especially in the context of ambulatory monitoring and as uh, Vadim highlighted in his presentation, we definitely need uh, novel statistical approaches to be able to analyze and interpret the data. Uh, with this, I will conclude the presentation and probably move into Q&A. Um, we have questions um, prepared or we are gonna ask from the audience. I'm looking at Steve and Joe. You tell us how do we want to do. So why don't we start with one of the um, the questions uh, that we, we kind of were thinking through uh, prior uh, and that you have as your backup, and then I'm sure people will jump in. Um, but I guess one of the questions I, I have with this is, is how and when um, do you begin to, to pull in and start thinking about the reference ranges for areas where um, uh, you, you don't have them, and, ha and how to how to compare that to the the, um, you know, the ambulatory data that you have, the, the act activity monitors, etc. Um, this particular discussion and the case study really brought that home as to the fact that something everybody feels like they know, heart rate. Um, we don't. Uh, you know, there's a, there's a huge gap when you start measuring it constantly. So when when do you think, and how how would you go about doing that if you're starting over? Um, Joe, before answering the question, I would like to start with introduction of this um, panel, and I would let my colleagues to introduce themselves. Hi, um, my name is Chiliu. I'm a senior science advisor from the Office of Clinical Pharmacology, Cedar. Um, in our office, we have a scientific interest group for novel data analytics. We're very interested in the application of digital health tools, real-world data, as well as novel algorithms such as machine learning to help drug development, especially in the clinical pharmacology evaluations. Thank you for the meeting organizers for inviting me here. I look forward to learn from everybody. Thank you. I'm Dan Bloomfield. I'm a cardiologist by training and actually spent my first nine years 
studying things like these rhythm disturbances from kind of recordings that, like you saw here. I, I then spent 15 years at, at Merck uh, in a variety of roles and now work for a small bot that called Anthos Therapeutics. And my name is Elena Ismailova. As you already figured out from my presentation, I am a um, bench scientist uh, by training. Um, uh, after completing my academic training, I spent 15 years in pharma doing biomarkers in clinical trials, both uh, wet lab biomarkers and digital biomarkers. And right now, I'm chief scientific officer for Conexa Health. Okay. In terms of um, answering Joe's question, going back to Joe's questions about um, uh, finding uh, ranges and uh, reference intervals, um, thoughts, then do you want to comment on, on that? Because you dealt with that extensively. So, so I think the, the question boils down to what are you trying to measure and what do you want to do with it? Because there's lots and lots of experience with, uh, with digital ECG waveforms. And so if your question lends itself to short-term um, measurements, we have lots of data from multiple recordings. If it's a waveform issue, we have lots of data on, on 12 lead ECG recordings or uh, whether it's single ECGs or 24-hour ECGs. I think the area that's really not, not studied before is what happens over the course of five or six days. We know that heart rate varies diagonally it's slower at night, speeds up during the day. <clears throat> so we, we know that, but how many times during the day one has a spike in heart rate, is it, is it known? Um, how often that happens at night, is it known over the course of, of weeks? The ability to link the accelerometer to ECG has never really been studied in, in a way that would be, uh, would be considered a reference range, but it's a very nice combination because having no movement on the accelerometer and having a very high heart rate doesn't fit. So I think a lot of what would need to get done is the, the question about um, how do you clean up the data? What are the algorithms that are used in order to remove noise? Because you'd hate to remove a real signal. On the other hand, there's lots of noise that's hard to interpret. So I think that's another area that would need to be validated. Yeah. Um, I want to make a quick comment about, I think this question also brings up the importance of data sharing because a lot of information we think we might know what is a normal range, but it might be a moving target. For example, recently there's a publication showing us like the normal body temperature of the population has gone down, right? So what we used to think is normal now may not be normal. And so that brings importance of more information sharing and timely information sharing. Questions from the audience? Thoughts? Oh, I can always depend on Don Bill. <laughs> so, yeah, so let's, uh, I'll ask Dr. Bloomfield particularly. So let's re reduce this to a sort of real life example of whether or not you believe as cardiologists or clinical pharmacologists that we would do a better job characterizing, say, the risk of. Uh, prolongation, which has plagued the field of uh, antipsychotic drug development. And signals are picked up, certain antipsychotic drugs using current technologies. By now, we probably have some reasonable knowledge about how often that leads to real problems in clinical populations. And um, when we look at such data in early clinical development, different groups have made different decisions about how big that risk was on the data generated at that time. So I'm really asking, do you believe that the remote monitoring will do a better job of coming up with predictors of ultimate risk from things like QT prolongation or something like that, okay? I mean, because that would be a real business, I mean, not only a business case, but a safety and human health case. So what is it going to take to come to with a real case study to demonstrate, and I'm just trying to give you a concrete example of the advantage of this. Yeah, thanks, Bill. So, so what, what Bill's referring to are, are abnormalities in the waveforms I showed you, the, the QRS, the T-wave, and, and prolongation of the QT interval is a well-known toxicity of, of drugs. 
So we, we've done a lot of work over, over the years. Um, I, I led the ICH um, working group for a while on trying to apply new technologies to measure QTC. And, and we successfully, success, successfully did that with Holt recordings, which are, are, are really robust 12 um, lead type recordings you can wear for 24 to 48 hours. And actually the, the FDA, the PMJ, and the EMEA will accept those data as, um, as uh, <coughs> excluding or, or, or calling out um, an issue with QTC. Maybe it's there but at a very high exposure, um, or maybe it's, it's not there and you've convinced them that there's really no risk. I think to translate that to these kind of wearable type devices is a pretty high hurdle because the, the amount of, of noise reduction you'd have to have to get robust measurements of QTC would be pretty challenging. Um, there's also a question about the applicability, but why would you need to do that? So if a drug really is going to prolong QT over a long period of time, that's going to be a real challenge to study. Um, and, and, and probably they'd have to come back into a unit and get it measured re recurrently, because I, I think you probably wouldn't get uh, a sufficiently accurate measurement from, from a wearable device right now. Yeah, I completely agree with Dan. I think maybe in a phase one QD evaluation study, the current um, paradigm, for example, using the 12 lead holder has been done a very good job. But I can imagine there may be scenarios, for example, if you're not just looking for QT evaluation, but you're looking for AFib, for a drug that has a, maybe a arrhythmia potential. And then in the later trials, if you can use maybe some other um, digital technology tools that can help detect AFib, that might be very meaningful. Hi, Steve Berman, FDA. When we think about uh, drug development, we think often about benefit risk, and implicit in the term benefit risk is benefit and risk to whom. And for the most part, we think benefit and risk to the patient. In the example that we just went through in this very good case study, when I was thinking about to whom the benefits accrue, I think a lot of the benefits in this particular example may not be to an individual patient, but rather to the drug developer or to the CRO marketing this technology to the drug developer. So could the panel comment on sort of benefit risk for digital monitoring and drug development sort of in that context? I'll just make sure I understand the question. So you talk about the benefit risk in drug development as opposed to the benefit risk for an individual subject. Is that what you're getting at? Right. So thinking about the slides that you presented, a lot of the benefits don't accrue to an individual patient. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. So the, the issue with individual patients is clinical medicine. Someone having to ask these questions of a patient in front of them. So you're right that the, what we approach this from the point of view of drug development. And, and the way I think about this is if you had a drug that had a preclinical signal on, let's say, heart rate, whether it's high or low, um, you know, you, you could potentially miss something in, in recordings that are in a clinical pharmacology unit over a short period of time. And, and in fact, you may need to see um, changes in heart rate and activities in order to bring out the abnormality. So for example, a drug might not let your heart rate increase when you're exercising. So you wouldn't necessarily know that in the unit where people aren't really exercising. So I, I think in that, in that scenario, you, you could take advantage of the fact that you're measuring data over a long period of time. And if you had a concern about something like that, you would be reassured. I don't think I would ever do this if I didn't have that concern. Because um, I, I think there's lots of challenges with false, false positives. But, mm -hmm. but if you had that concern um, and you couldn't feel comfortable, you could nail it down in that first 24 hours that this is a way to get it back. Great, yeah. thank you. Yeah, and another thing I want to add is I think some of the examples demonstrated here, um, for example, the increased sensitivity of the continuous dense data monitoring compared to the discrete in clinical measurement, that could potentially be a benefit. Maybe in this case, not, I'm not commenting on this case per se, but in general, if we can find a continuous high density monitoring that can provide higher sensitivity compared to the traditional measurement, that could be benefit for drug development. And I think, can I add a couple of things? This is Vadim. Go ahead. Great. So I'm working a lot, um, I'm working a lot in the uh, so-called circadian medicine, and <clears throat> I immediately see one possible um, immediate 
application, uh, you know, where the subject or patient would benefit is uh, identifying, you know, uh, patient-specific uh, circadian chronotype, you know, using the heart rate data, and then maybe um, adjusting, uh, like taking a beta blocker, you know, right before the heart rate, uh, you know, goes up or goes down, whatever, uh, in the consistent diurnal fashion. So I think, you know, from the circadian perspective, uh, that that's where one of the possible applications, uh, kind of for the patient individual um, level, So I think we have some questions at the, if we a little bit more time if you would like, um, that, that were uh, discussed ahead of time. I guess the one, the one question though, outside of this, is just a general feel from, from each of you as to um, if you were to do it again and or, or run this again, would, gets back to the framework, would the framework as it is now or have helped, I guess, and you know, what, what might still be a gap within that framework that you still would have lost? periods or periods where there's noise. And, and I think the, that's somewhat algorithm dependent, the algorithms are proprietary. But how you handle those is really, really important. And um, I think that came out over the course of the, of, of the study and we would have to get, get work through, you know, in much more, much more depth. I think the longer you record, the more likely you are to have more of those periods. So if you could record data for a week, instead you'd have much more of those episodes then how you deal with those are going to be important because as a drug developer, you don't want to write something off that could be a problem just because there's noise around it. On the flip side, you don't want to call something abnormal if it's, if it's not really abnormal. And how regulators would look at that, I think, is, is going to be important. So that's one issue that came up, I think, in the initial work that I think we need to get further clarified. make a comment it's not it's not related to the question but I just really like the example Dr. Baku Patel mentioned in the morning about how the GPS system was able to make very useful like recommendations based on information from a bunch of maybe not so reliable device or satellites right so this reminds me a conversation between me and a, a friend of mine Dr. Sebastian Throng because it's my personal opinion, I think, for the important uh, information that we'll be relying on it to make a decision, especially in the remote monitoring space. It to, might be nice to have more than one sensor or more than one device for the same data source. So when I talked to Do Dr. Sebastian Thorne, uh, he's actually in Silicon Valley known as the father of self-driving cars, and he has done a lot of work uh, to improve the safety of, tra of tra transportation. And he sent me a story about uh, the Boeing company, their 737 MAX, which used information, relayed information from a single sensor that was flagged to FAA for over 200 times. And then after the deadly crash, they decided to relay the information from two sensors, and some people have been questioning them. One why this has not been done in the first place. So I just felt when we start doing, using sensors and digital technology in the healthcare field, maybe there are lessons we could learn from those stories. Gee, there's two things I really liked about what you just said. The first is, I think, um, the more and more that we can draw on lessons learned from other industries that are ahead of us and using technology, the better. Um, I also, um, let's think of the context of use of the 737 MAX. Sadly, there have been some horrific accidents lately. It's clear that a single sensor to inform 
um, the decisions that were made around how that aircraft was safe in the sky was inadequate. Um, I, think, I think the same applies here. I think there are definitely situations where redundancy would be beneficial. I think there may be others where the safety concerns are less risky and perhaps we might lose a signal maybe you know after 24 hours that flags an automated sms after 48 hours maybe it flags you know a call from a coordinator um so i really like what you're saying on principle i love the concept of learning from another industry but i also think let's always be fit for purpose mm -hmm. there are definitely times where we'd want redundancy it's too important yeah. not to but i also don't want to um I don't want to force too much technology yes. where it might not mm -hmm. be necessary. Mm -hmm. So in, in a simple way, that um, that's kind of built into how we usually study mm -hmm. uh, rhythm, which is with le at least two leads. Mm -hmm. um, so if you have two mm -hmm. leads and one's noisy, you have a sense for what the issue is. In fact, 12 lead recordings is the standard, but for a different reason. 12 leads are looking at different perspectives of the heart. But two leads really is, is looking at rhythm, mm -hmm. and therefore if there's noise in one, the second one's clean, mm -hmm. I think that's, that's part of what's reassuring. So that's a simple example of of that, that issue. All right, so I'd like to uh, thank this panel and thank the, the group. It, it, very interesting uh, conversation, very interesting uh, uh, case study and thank you very much for putting it all together and, and helping us understand it.